All right, the next speaker is uh, Jerome Gauntlet, uh, who will talk, tell us surely what Suzy Q is and Boomerang RG flows. And thanks to uh, Johanna and the other organizers for this nice meeting. I want to talk about some work um, that I've been doing uh, mostly with um, Chris Rosen, who's in the audience. Right, he's, gonna, he's been the main driver of the results that I'll be discussing in this talk. Um, and what we understand has built on some previous collaboration with Aristomenes Donos and Omar Sousa Rodriguez. I also need to give uh, some additional credit to these people. Just a little pop quiz. Does, any, does anybody know who this is? Fair? Yeah? Yeah, anyone else? <laughs> Two people, both from UCLA. Three. Oh, okay. Well, okay. Well, they say if you, if you remember the 60s, you weren't really there. <laughs> this is Creedence Clearwater Revival. They wrote a very famous song called Suzy Q. Um, for the younger ones in the audience, they're rated higher than Jay-Z and the Rolling Stones' all-time greatest artists. Anyway, this was inspiration for the uh, title of um, uh, a construction, which I'll explain in this talk. Um, so everything I'll be describing is in the context of spatial modulations of holographic theories. So we take some uh, strongly coupled conformal field theory, and then we explicitly deform it by something that breaks, breaks the spatial translations of the CFT. And there's a number of reasons to be interested, interested in these deformations. In an applied holographic context, um, this is a framework which we just heard about a little bit in Carl's talk uh, for having finite GC conductivities. So in thinking about transport in the context of holography, you want to break translations in some way. And in fact, I spent a lot of time with other people thinking about this. And um, once you deform the theories with, with uh, some operators that break translations, you can realize this interesting physics. You can have metals with Bruder peaks when you break translations weakly. You can have strange metals where, which corresponds to strongly breaking translations. And you can also realize insulators when you have some gap in the power spectrum of the AC conductivity at small frequencies. In a different direction, um, there's been a long tradition uh, started by uh, Michael Gopkel, who's here, and collaborators, and many other people, of studying defects or interface theories also known as Janus theories in the context of holography. And now also can be viewed as CFTs with these spatially modulated deformations. So what I want to talk about in today's talk is something uh, slightly complementary, and it's uh, what we call boomerang flows. So a boomerang flow is you start off with a CFT in the UV, and then you deform it, and then you flow back in the infrared, and you come back to the same CFT. So people are used to RG flows where you start off with a CFT in the UV and you flow to a different conformal field theory in the IR. Uh, that's not happening here. And the reason is, uh, is that we're breaking translations um, explicitly. So when you break translations explicitly, effectively at long wavelengths, that deformation becomes an ir irrelevant deformation. But that's unitary. No, it's unitary. I'll show you. <laughs> Um, well, within holography, I'll show you. So the only remnant of, uh, the only difference between the UV and the IR is that there's a relative renormalization of length scales between the UV and the IR, and I'll, I'll explain that in more detail in a concrete example. So these are interesting in themselves, and holography can show, allows you a framework where you can study these from strong coupling, at strong coupling in, in detail at all energy scales. A theorem doesn't apply because we've broken translations. Exactly. Um, a, something universal that can happen is they can exhibit intermediate scaling. And again, I'll, I'll provide an example later to explain that. They can be viewed as a novel way of resolving singularities in the context of holography. We have RG flows where in the infrared you realize some singular configuration, and you might want to resolve that by some small deformation and I'll explain how that can be done within the context of these flows. They are a good tool to generate uh, quantum phase transitions. That's something I won't be talking about in this talk, but you can ask me afterwards if you're interested. And the new thing, or a new thing, a particularly new thing, is 
um, somewhat surprisingly, we can preserve supersymmetry as well, which I will talk about. So everything will be in the context of Q-lattices. We've heard about Q-lattices or examples of Q-lattices a couple of times already in this conference. Um, and the idea of a Q-lattice is that, uh, so in general, if you, want to sponsor, if you were looking at spatial modulations of CFTs, you've got dependence of your bulk fields on the direction you're breaking translations, and then you've got dependence on the radial directions. So in general, you're going to have to solve a system of PDEs. And that's the general framework for these kinds of questions. But it's good to look for interesting ways uh, where you simplify that problem to solving ordinary differential equations. So these are toy models that have been very useful in teasing out what's going on. So the Q-lattice just simply says, exploits the possibility that you have a, a, a bulk global symmetry. Not a bulk gauge symmetry, a bulk global symmetry, which in the boundary theory corresponds to some fine tuning of couplings and masses. So a simple example would be a four dimensional uh, theory of gravity coupled to a single complex scalar field. And in this context, the simple global symmetry is just a phase rotation. So a constant phase rotation is a global symmetry of that Lagrangian I've written down. Um, and that allows you then to write down an ansatz for spatially modulated fields um, that only requires you solve ordinary differential equations. So the scalar just has this uh, row, uh, well, the met metrics here. So I've just picked out one direction, the spatial x direction is preferred, r is the radial holographic direction. And z is just uh, rho cos kx plus i sine kx, and rho a, v, and n are all functions of r. And the reason why that's possible is this spatially modulated um, scalar field, if you calculate its bulk stress tensor, it's invariant under the global symmetry, and so that doesn't provide any spatial sources for the stress tensor, and therefore for the metric. So the problem now, or in other words, this ansatz, the global symmetries, allows you to solve exactly for the spatial symmetry, in this, in this case the x direction, exactly, and you're just left with solving a system of ODEs. So that's a four-dimensional example that's anisotropic and depends on one spatial direction, but you can easily have uh, generalize this to higher dimensions, and if you have additional global symmetries with two commuting killing vectors, you could have isotropic examples where you break translations in two directions or three or whatever you like. So it's a robust symmetry, and you can have more scalar fields, more complicated uh, global symmetries, and so on. What's a SUSY-Q? A SUSY-Q is a supersymmetric Q-lattice. So it's just a Q-lattice construction that preserves supersymmetry. So the example um, that we'll look at, um, this is not meant to be a comprehensive uh, as yet analysis, but within the context of four-dimensional supergravity coupled to a single scalar field, this is the full story. So um, n equals one supergravity coupled to a single chiral multiplet, we just have a Lagrangian like this. G is, a, so Z parameterizes a Kähler manifold and G is a metric on it. So it's um, uh, given by this um, two derivatives on the Kähler potential. V is a potential constructed out of this W in this way, and W is related to the superpotential by a factor of e to the k on two. So if you want to look at supergravity and you want to look at Q-lattice constructions, your bulk action should have a global U1 symmetry. So your Kähler potential should just depend on the modulus of Z. And if you want to have supersymmetry, this is not obvious, but if you go through the super restrictive, but we'll see that it doesn't preclude some interesting top-down examples. In more detail, uh, if you look at the supersymmetry variations, um, the BPS equations you get is this system here. So these are functions, uh, first order equations for the variables in the metric, A, V, and N, or, um, well, A, v, 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 and N, and also for rho. And you'll notice that the dependence on the spatial direction just is via K appearing in the right-hand side of these equations. So in particular, if K is zero, these are the Poincaré invariant BPS equations, which many of you know and love. And when you switch on this, the spatially modulated source, you get these k-dependent uh, sources on the right-hand side. So when k is zero, you see that these two equations are actually identical, and v is a. So you get a Poincaré invariant RG flow, and the supersymmetry is just this radial projection onto the supersymmetry parameter. And when k is not epsilon, is minus epsilon. 
And this only works if the superpotential W, which I put there as, a, as, as a, what looks like a function, is actually a constant. So uh, can you realize this in top down? And the answer is yes. And there's a very nice realization. So let me remind you, we start off with 11-dimensional supergravity. And if we reduce on a seven sphere consistently, we get to n equals eight gauge supergravity. And what consistently means is that any solution of that latter theory uplifts to an exact solution of 11-dimensional supergravity. <coughs> That's a little bit unwieldy, so let's keep projecting it out further. If we demand that we just keep fields that are invariant under SO4 cross SO4 in SO8, then you reduce to n equals four gauge supergravity in four dimensions, which has SO4 gauge fields as well as a single uh, complex scalar. Let's get rid of the gauge fields. And you find that in n equals one language, you get just a single complex scalar field parameterizing the Poincare disk. And in fact, W is constant. So we're in business. We can find solutions to the supergravity theory with these inputs, and then uplift explicitly to get 11-dimensional super, uh, solutions preserving supersymmetry uh, of 11-dimensional supergravity. Um, I'm saying, you know, because, because people always say you cannot have global symmetries in quantum gravity and instantly, or... No, so, so, I mean, you can, you can in super, in gravity you can, in supergravity you can, that's not a problem. What's, what's a but problem is quantum, gra quantum, quantum, quantum gravity is a problem, for example, black hole evolution, right. but these were one on N effects. Also here, you started out with... No, this, this has, for example, I mean, that's a global symmetry. Yes, but there's, I mean, there's this, uh, I mean, these parameterize this coset E7 mod SU, SU8, and this, this, has a, this has a U1. These are parameterizing SL2 mod SO2, and that SO2 is part of the N equals H gauge supergravity global symmetry. So in supergravity is perfectly fine to have global symmetry. Okay, so the point of this is you can do Suzy Q, and you can uplift it to 11 dimensions, and hopefully if there's time, you'll, uh, we'll, we'll do that. So let me start, use that theory and just remind you of a few points. It has a vacuum, which is just ADS4, which lifts to ADS4 cross S7. We can also take a quotient of that S7 by U1. So we decompose SO8 into U1 cross SU4 and take a quotient, a cyclic quotient of the S7 by this U1 action. And then we realize holographically ABJM theory uh, at level Q. At this point, all I want to say is, uh, in this ABGM theory, there's an operator with delta is one, another one with delta is two, and the real and the imaginary parts of this complex scalar uh, correspond to those two operators. In other words, if you just, these two scalars are a case where you can do alternative quantization for each of them, but supersymmetry demands that you have delta is one for one of them, and delta is two for the other one. Otherwise, it's not supersymmetric. So how do we realize this? Well, this is a very well-established procedure called holographic renormalization. And for this specific case, there were some recent papers which implemented this on the nose. And you just add in a boundary term, which is an extrinsic curvature term, the standard one, make sure you have proper variational principle. There's a superpotential term, which is necessary by supersymmetry. And then there's this extra term, which ensures that delta is one. And I just wanted to highlight this point, obvious point, that uh, that boundary term does not preserve the global symmetry. And I'll come back to that point in a second. So let's, before we look at the boomerang flows with K non-zero, the Q lattice of the Suzy Q, let's just look at the K equals zero flows, which are ordinary RG flows. In fact, they're ordinary, and they've been looked at for many years, uh, starting with Pope and Warner. They correspond to mass deformations of ABGM theory. Um, and if you solve the BPS equations with k equals zero, there's actually an analytic solution. So a just takes this form and z takes this form. And if you look at that for just two seconds, you'll see that that's singular when r is mu. But that singularity is also well understood. Notice that there's a little theta here. Theta is an arbitrary constant. That's a good solution for any value of that theta. That's just the global U1 symmetry. At the level of four-dimensional solutions, it doesn't do much. But when you uplift to 11 dimensions, it does a lot. If theta equals zero, 
you find that your solution has a source for this delta is one operator. Sorry, it has VEV for this delta is one operator and no sources. And it just corresponds to a Coulomb branch RG flow. You've taken all your membranes that are sitting on top of each other and you've just taken an SO4 cross SO4 distribution of those and that's exactly what that singularity is. If you switch on theta, you start sourcing the delta is two operator and uh, from 11 dimensional point of view, some of those membranes are puffing up into five brains via the dielectric effect. So this is some well-established physics that's been looked at for many years. These are the K equals zero RG flows. So just remember that they're understood and that they're singular as R goes to zero. Um, and one more thing, and that uh, various operators for these flows are gapped. And that's very easy to see. If we calculate, um, uh, if we calculate the spectral density, for example, for a marginal operator, we should take a master sc scalar field in the bulk. We should solve its linearized equation. We should impose ingoing boundary conditions at infinity. Read it, take the ratio of the source to the VEV at infinity, and we get the retarded Green's function. Again, you can do that analytically, and this is the answer. And the thing just to notice about that answer is that it's real for omega less than 2 mu. So there's no spectral weight when omega is less than 2 mu. That's a hard gap. So here, here is an example of an operator. A marginal operator could be fluctuations of the two-point uh, correlators of the stress tensor. It has a hard gap. OK, let's now switch on K non-zero and look at the boomerang flows. So we have those BPS equations, which I'm not writing down again. But if you start solving them perturbatively, you want to go to ADS at the boundary in the UV. And because we're looking at BPS equations, it turns out that the leading and the subleading pieces of the, real, the, the, radio, the um, modulus of the scalar field are correlated. In fact, the full solutions are specified by a dimensionless parameter, lambda on k. And that, that point is going to be important in a second. If you follow through holographic renormalization, using those boundary terms I said before, you'll find you have a source for the delta is one operator of this form and a source for the delta is two operator of this form. And that's that correlation between the two that's preserving supersymmetry. If you change these relative constants or change the modulation, then it won't be in general supersymmetry. You have VEVs for the corresponding operators. An interesting fact is that the stress tensor is spatially modulated. So why is that interesting? Well, one interesting thing is that it's spatially modulated. If you think about a Q-lattice construction for a second, the metric is independent of the spatial coordinates. So naively, you would expect the stress tensor is going to be spatially homogeneous. The extrinsic curvature contribution of the stress tensor, tensor is spatially homogeneous. And I think just implicitly in the literature, everyone thought that was the case. But if your boundary terms break the global symmetry, then that's not necessarily the case. And in fact, supersymmetry demands that you break the global symmetry so that you quantize the delta is one and delta is two operators appropriately. So you go ahead and do that, and you get the energy density is now spatially modulated, as well as some of the pressure in the x direction. So that's one interesting thing. And the second interesting thing is that if you look at how, what happens if you average this over a period, you get zero. So these are configurations, deformed configurations of CFT, where the average energy density is zero, and it's not the vacuum. Or the vacuum in the spatially modulated sector has exactly zero average energy density. And that's why supersymmetry is being preserved. So supersymmetry is being preserved because of this novel feature of these fully back-reacted, strongly coupled, spatially deformed uh, CFTs. Let's now look at uh, solving the uh, RG equations, the BPS equations with those boundary conditions. So uh, as I said before, the equations actually just depend on this dimensionless parameter, lambda on k. Let's imagine lambda on k is very small, and let's solve the equations perturbatively in lambda on k. So we take ADS, and we solve the linearized equation for rho in that background, and you get this behavior here depending on, well, I could write that as lambda on k times k on r. And then I see how that back reacts on the metric at order lambda on k squared. And it turns out you can solve that exactly. It returns to the vacuum for rho 
and this term drops out and this term drops out and we see that we have exactly ADS4 plus a renormalization of length scales. So this demonstrates that you have a boomerang flow. So as R goes to infinity, it satisfies the boundary of ADS4 with the appropriate sources switched on. And when we've gone far in the infrared, R goes to zero, all that's been washed out just simply because of this e to the minus k on, a k on R behavior that you see there manifestly. In other words, this is an example of how boomerang flows are generic, in the, at least in these Q-lattice constructions. Because this e to the minus k on R behavior is taking your scalar, which is a relevant operator, dual to a relevant operator in this case, and solving it in the ADS background. And if, if people have looked at this in general, that'll be some kind of Bessel function in general. This is just a particularly easy one for this model. So there'll be always some e to the minus k on R fall off, and that'll get always washed out in the far infrared. So for small perturbations around ADS, when you break uh, translations by uh, a relevant operator in a Q-lattice construction, you'll always get a boomerang flow. How about if lambda on K is not small? Well, if lambda is on K, oh, so before I say that, yeah. So um, I, I sort of said this point, but let me say it again. So as we went to R to zero, this dies out and this dies out, and you're just left with this little correction here. So this is the remnant of the renormalization, or it is the renormalization of length scales I mentioned at the beginning. So here is uh, the ansatz for the metric. If we're in the ADS4, um, if we're in an ADS4 solution, e to the A minus V is the speed of light. Now you can always scale T and X, so that speed of light is one. You can do that at infinity, but then what you get in the infrared is, is going to be a diagnostic, a physical observable of the RG flow. In other words, e to the a minus v divided by e to the a minus v in the UV and the IR is an invariant, and correspondingly, as it's the ratio of the speeds of lights, we call it the refractive index. I think Steve Gubser was the first one who came up with that term. Um, so uh, for the boomerang flows, I sort of, you could sort of see it that n of x is proportional to the dimensionless parameter lambda on k squared. And actually, interestingly, you can show by solving the BPS equations that this is always bigger than 1. In fact, in all examples we've found, this is always bigger than 1. We don't have a proof for every, every construction, but I suppose we conjecture that that's always true. So boomerang flows in holography always have this refractive index bigger than 1. There might be a field theory argument for that as well, but I don't know. If we want to go beyond the perturbative flows, we have to go back to the BPS equations and start solving them numerically. There are ODEs, but you have to solve them numerically um, with the appropriate boundary conditions at the UV. And you can do that. And it turns out with this model that they exist for arbitrary large values of lambda on K. Now, this is not guaranteed. The perturbative ones are guaranteed, but as a lambda on K gets big, the RG flow could go off to some other behavior in the infrared. The only thing you're guaranteed is a boomerang flow for small lambda on K. But for this model, they exist for arbitrary large values of lambda on K. When that happens, some interesting things happen, which I now want to explain. Um, so here's a little picture, in fact. So here's our radius 4, and let's think of this little loop as a boomerang flow for, that's perturbative in lambda on K. And then we start cranking up lambda on K. We keep by coming back to the ADS. And then if you just think about that for a second, if lambda is fixed, or lambda on K large is the same as lambda fixed and K goes to zero. So if the boomerang flows exist for arbitrary large values of lambda on K, they must eventually start tracking a K equals zero Poincare invariant flow. In other words, that flow here, the very large values of the dimensionless parameter that's getting very close to this line, is going to be almost exactly the same as this solution, just diving away from the singularity in infrared here and then zooming back to ADS4. And here's a picture, for example, of the scalar field. So it has a profile like this. This is the radial direction. This is the profile of the modulus of the real scalar field. And there's a little dot dotted line which is going along here, and it stops there. That's, that's exactly that blue line. So the solution is almost singular. It's almost a Poincare invariant flow, and it dives back to ADS in the infrared. And we can see that another way. If we look at, say, the uh, Ricci scalar, uh, Ricci scalar against the radius, so we have the UV here, 
And the dotted line here, which hopefully you can see, is where the Poincaré invariant flow is becoming singular. So this pollution is going down here, and it drops down as close as, as you like, as long as you keep lambda on k large, and eventually dies back. So this is the singularity resolution mechanism I, I mentioned. If you take that Poincaré invariant flow, you can resolve that singularity, getting perfectly good behavior in the infrared, ADS4, by taking a boomerang flow with arbitrary large lambda on k. And that's a mechanism that, that will work for any boomerang flow as long as they exist for arbitrary large values of that coupling, which, as I said, is not guaranteed. But in this model, it happens. And that same point then tells you that this hard gap that I mentioned that for the Poincaré invariant flow, remember that the real part of the spectral va function vanished for omega less than 2 mu? We now see that, that this, but these boomerang flows will revo resolve that, that hard gap. They'll resolve it because the, solution, the, the spectral function for frequencies above 2 mu will almost be exactly the same as the Poincaré invariant flow, but the solution for very small frequencies will be dominated by this region, which will be the power law behavior that's dictated by ADS4 at small frequencies. So you'll get this hard gap, almost to, to, to zero weight, and then a little bump as you went down to omega goes to zero. Index of refraction, well, it turns out that as you, if you plot lambda against k against log n, then it seems to be basically running off to be an exponential behavior for very large values of lambda on k. There's probably some good explanation for that, but we couldn't find, find it apart from this numerical plot. In other models, it's not exponential. It, sometimes it goes off to a constant, sometimes it goes linearly, or maybe it's power law in some other cases. So I think there's some interesting questions about that one observable, um, what happens in general. OK, so I've um, got a couple more minutes. Two. Um, OK, so very briefly then, uh, let me just say uh, what, 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 what these are in the ABJM theory. In fact, let me just skip that slide. I'll just assume you know what ABJM theory is. Um, if you don't, you can just tune up this slide. There's some scalars. Uh, in the four representation, so this is a mass term for the uh, scalars. This is a delta is one operator. There's some fermions also transforming in a four of SU4. This is a delta is two operator, and supersymmetry says you better correct it appropriately like this. Um, there was a paper by Kim and Kwon, quite independently of the work that I've just been describing, and they show that ABJM theory with an arbitrary M of X, where this, oh, I didn't say what MAB was. MAB is a matrix which has two positive eigenvalues and two negative eigenvalues as diagonal. And that M appears here and here. And the M that's appearing, and then there's a function at M of X that appears here, M prime of X appearing here, and there's an M squared appearing there. This is exactly what we've constructed for the special value of M of X equals sine KX. So we'll have a sine KX times the delta is two operator, a cos KX times the delta is one operator, and what about this in supergravity? Well, that's an operator that you don't see in supergravity, so it's consistent. What they showed is that, in general, this, these deformations of ABGM theory preserve n equals 3 supersymmetry for an arbitrary function of x. What the supergravity calculation shows is that for q is 1 and 2, there'll be an enhancement of that to n equals 4. Um, what about other values of mx? Well, in general, one's going to have to solve PDEs if one wants to get at this get at this result. But I should just mention that uh, Micron collaborators um, and Daria, Daria Krim's also here, um, uh, there is a Janus solution in this uh, SO4 cross SO4 gauge supergravity, which provides another example of these deformations. OK, I can see the chair standing up. I'm going to just flash that up. If you want to ask me after the talk, you can do. It's the fact that in addition to the intermediate scaling I mentioned, you can have another possible intermediate scaling for these boomerang flows. I don't expect you to understand that, but if you're very curious to speak, ask me afterwards, and I'll just put up some questions and comments, and you can read them while you are finished there. Thanks. Thanks, Jordan, for the nice talk. <laughs> we, we got time for one or two quick questions. Thanks, Jerome, for the nice talk.
we, we got time for one or two quick questions. So, um, the first one, I, I seem to understand that it's the same solution in the beginning and in the end of the flow, so it's the same F4 when you look at it in M-theory. Am I correct? The same F4, four form. Four form, yes. Yeah. Uh, this four form is obviously in the ends of the flow quantized. Is, is quantized the charge of it? The, the charge of this, is it quantized? Yes, yes, in the end of the flow. Is it quantized along the flow? Um, uh, I, I can ask the other question because uh, I can yeah, tell I later why, why I'm asking this. Okay, okay. okay. It, you mentioned very briefly, maybe you want to comment a bit about phase transitions here. I, mean, I would say, sorry, just, I mean, from the ABGM theory. Yeah, it should be. It should be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's going to be no problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree. I agree. It, you mentioned something about phase transitions. Can you comment which okay. observable will feel this phase yeah. transition? So, in the models, as I said, there was this symmetric transfer phase. That was delta 1, deformation of delta 2. You have a different dimension operator with some other lambda on K to some other power. The, if the boomerang flows, if they exist all the way to large values that coupling, you will approach upon carrying your own flow. But in some cases, there's another fixed point in your theory floating around, and when you start cranking up that coupling, there's a, like a bifurcation of flows, and you start flowing off to that other, that other behavior. You said you're applying a classification to You said another fixed point that I have said it was five times. Okay, so this, this, was an, this was another model. In fact, this is not the point there. This is, a, this is the example where that point there is not a solution, a hyperscaling violation solution, but it's not a solution to equations in motion. So why have I put it on there? It's, an it's a solution to an approximate theory of gravity. So when the scalar field is at large, your whole action can have a solution. So it's not a theory of solution to your theory itself, but it's a solution when the field is at large. But it can fix and dominate the scalar behavior of your solution. So that's particularly interesting, that non-fixed point solutions or hyperscaling violation can dominate scaling of your theory. And there's no direct field theory analog with that. And then if that was a fixed point, this would look like some more technical or something like that. But there's no flow in these fixed point solutions because that's not even in your theory. All right, um, in view of time, uh, let's defer the other questions to the coffee break. Links, and thanks, uh, Jerome, again.